Welcome everyone, wherever you may be. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, it's good to welcome you to today's webinar titled Deliver a Seamless Claims Customer Experience Using Innovative Tech. This is a, a webinar that's associated in the run-up to the Connected Insurance Canada Conference for September 10th and 11th in Toronto. The subject matter is relevant, um, however, to um, all of our North American and European insurance colleagues. And I will give you more information uh, during the webinar about that conference. But for today, as you can see, we have two terrific, uh, very experienced experts uh, in both enterprise data architecture and in advanced analytics from the insurance industry. And I will shortly introduce uh, in greater length both uh, Craig Milroy from Sun Life Financial and Kusha Gomahamadi from Manulife. But let me start off, if I may, by just setting the stage for today's conversation and discussion and for the conference itself. Um, everybody is, understands that AI or artificial intelligence in all of its different um, applications is attracting an awful lot of copy and print and even hype, but uh, to strip through all that and focus on what's real and what's important and what's valuable, what's happening within the insurance industry. Um, I'd just like to share some broad opening uh, comments to you. They're right out of today's headlines and from yesterday's research. And so we'll start with this. Within two years, nearly three quarters of companies will be using AI or planning to do so. This is according to a Wall Street Journal article released this morning in Wall, St Wall Street Journal Pro. Adoption of artificial intelligence will experience a big increase in the next two years as technology begins to prove itself in core business operations and it's pr as predicted by a new report from consulting firm Deloitte LLP. Business adoption of AI is expected to surge. Artificial intelligence, intelligence globally will experience its biggest increase as it begins to prove itself in core business. The report says 25% of businesses surveyed have implemented cognitive technologies such as AI or machine learning, either as pilot projects or as long-term strategies to remain competitive. Finally, what is driving the change? The expected surge in adoption is also being driven by the reported success of AI in optimizing business operations and by the anxiety of being left behind if firms ignore AI. Now to narrow our remarks down to the insurance industry specifically and today's discussions and the conference agenda, we're going to focus on this. In a competitive world of the Canadian insurance and in fact the global insurance industry, Keeping customers happy throughout the single moment of truth, a claim, is a critical priority for insurance carriers. Today we'll discuss and learn how leading claims executives across Canada are implementing strategies to deliver a seamless customer experience across the claims process, prioritizing speed of claims resolution, dynamic customer communication, and quality of customer service. In our, note, in our discussion today, we'll touch upon how to process claims quicker and give the customer control, keeping customers in the loop and redu reducing frustration and engaging with customers throughout their preferred channel of communication. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce um, our speakers for today. Uh, we do have a generous Q&A session on the back end of the webinar, and as you probably have uh, had done before or are aware, you can submit questions using the uh, chat box on the uh, webinar app that you've logged on to. And we'll handle those, as I said, at the back end. And also, if you have questions for either Craig or Kusha as we're going, please just jot them down and um, don't try to remember them, but jot them down and then send them in whenever you're free to do that. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing our first speaker today, Craig Milroy. As you can see on your screen, Craig is Director of Enterprise Data Architecture with Sun Life Financial. I'd like to share 
some background on Craig to put his comments in better context here. As a results-oriented data and analytics leader, Craig's career spans 15 years of business strategy enablement within enterprise data architecture and digital transformation roles. He has led many data central, sorry, data-centric digital transformation initiatives to enable strategic business growth through the deployment of industry-leading data and analytics capabilities. Craig has worked within financial services and telecommunications industries, including TD Bank Group US, Rogers Communication, Harris Bank Chicago, and BMO Financial Group. Currently, Craig leads global data and analytics architecture for Sun Life Financial with oversight for the data and analytics cloud transformation program. Please welcome Craig Milroy. Craig, love to have your comments. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to walk you through a, a few conversations uh, around the transformational effect of uh, customer experience and claims. And what we need to do and what we need to consider is how do we you know, automate and improve processes to drive faster uh, throughput, you know, get to real time, uh, and enable a superior customer experience. And a lot of times, you know, we have those conversations that we talk about, we want to be real time, we want it to be really transformational. But the reality is, is that we're kind of stuck in our legacy investments that we've held for quite some time. What continually, continually comes up in conversation is that, you know, Google is real time. Amazon is going to enter the insurance market. We need to be more like Amazon. Or what about all these insure tech startups that are taking, you know, bits and pieces of our business? and really focusing and enabling that unique client experience across all, um, all insurance sectors. You know, from health, you have Google, I think, fully is investing in Oscar. You got auto where, with uh, roots spinning up. You got life insurance, uh, thinking differently around some of the startups. And why can't we move faster? Why can't we be like them? How can we react? And I think the good news is a couple of things is that we have the clients, we know them, we have the capital investment to actually make things happen. It's really how do we start to think differently around how do we think about removing our legacy debt and focusing on, I think, two key areas that the, the client enables today is our, our web experience and more, 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 more importantly today is the mobile. All these pieces are coming together and then we have all this transformation around AI. You know, we all want AI, machine learning, how can we start to think about data science and think differently about our data? But all this data is locked within our legacy systems. And they're, they're really holding it back from us, um, us being the insurance industry, from really uh, achieving a true uh, digital experience. And so a lot of times, uh, more importantly today, is really rethinking about how we do business, really rethinking about our legacy and how to start to think more digitally around that. So. A couple of conversations around what other uh, groups are doing and what they're considering is that with this legacy debt, you know, do we replace it? Really do a, a net new build out of a net new system to support our digital end end uh, capabilities? Do we refactor our legacy environments to uh, to expedite some of the claims? Do we, you know, modernize some pieces but keep the the legacy core full? Do we uh, take a, a hybrid approach in terms of um, fixing pieces? investing more in web, mobile, and, and chatbots? Or, you know, do we really think, dispense with, uh, you know, hold on to the legacy, but think about more of a digital experience or a digital hub that will allow us now to compete with the startups and allow us to focus on web, mobile, chatbots, provide that real-time experience, and loosely coupling our that digital experience with our legacy. So you kind of have that two-pronged approach. And that's really about supporting the real-time needs uh, whether it's claims or onboarding clients or providing updates and improving that client experience that the startups and Amazon and Googles are all exceeding. So it's how do we change the conversation? How do we think differently about um, our environments? And what we really want to do is, you know, how do we process claims quicker, give the customer control? And it's really about automation. It's self-service. It's, it's putting um, the power of the, the web and mobile and other capabilities to use. But that really takes 
I, I think, some thought around how you want to manage your business going forward. And a lot of times, it's uh, in a lot of you know insurance organizations, lines of business are actually product groups where they're individually siloed and they own clients. And you can never have that, never attain that kind of one insurance company uh, experience in terms of branding. So you go, you deal with a group, you deal with uh, your retirement services, you deal with wealth, you do deal with uh, you know life insurance. How do you sort of bring that together in a one umbrella so there's you have that unified client approach? And how do you start to have um, experiences for your clients that are generated by looking at the data, what they expect to see in terms of, you know, are they high value clients? Are they other clients uh, with uh, within sponsor groups that need to think that have higher value or lower value? How do you sort of place that and use data analytics to sort of drive that forward? Uh, how do you start to think, you know, today we're very batch oriented with insurance. We have the legacy mainframe. How can we think differently around lowering the cost of that legacy by enabling a more of a digital real time um, solution? And this is really going to take a, a you think, a top down approach um, in terms of the CEO and others sort of looking down and prioritizing our you know, digital initiatives that we want to get at. Um, a line of business by line of business is certainly not going to achieve that client experience or that unified client experience and product approach, really having that top-down focus is going to really focus the priorities in terms of what investments you want to make. Organizations today are looking at, you know, robotic process automation, the RPA or the, you know, the AI to use to, to streamline some of the processes that we have today. You know, those paper-based processes, how can we sort of digitize them through process automation? How can we leverage, uh, you know, data science to look at do a deep dive in all the claims and actually understand, you know, do we want to have different criteria of claims? Do we want to deep dive in certain claims and have, you know, more of the pedestrian claims automatically adjudicated and processed? And deep learning can help that. So as we go forward with machine learning and, and deep learning, we can start to think about more of an API centric approach where real time we can start to use machine learning to adjudicate uh, based on a client, based on the product, based on other activities and data points that are coming into our organization. Finally, the cloud, I think, is key in terms of enabling some of this infrastructure and capability. The fact that uh, today, very difficult to, to solution a lot of these pieces on-premise. Um, a cloud allows us to get to that, not necessarily lower cost, but time to market, which is becoming key um, to support the, uh, the insurance domains. Keeping customers in the loop is a, another key piece as well. Um, a lot of times where you, you submit a claim and you don't know where the claim is in the process other than it's in process. So how do you start to have that kind of real time feedback in terms of much like you see in Domino's Pizza where you see the order from order to the baking to making your pizza to actually delivery. How do you think differently around that whole process? And, and that sort of allows the, the client to understand where they are. And maybe you know, you know, reduces the, the the calls into the call center to ask where you know what status is on my client uh, on my claim. Really key is is that all these organizations to get that you know real time touch points, client portals, um, equipping you know up to date information really takes uh, a client you know a client focused experience and product focused experience to drive uh, with that's going to be enabled through digital transformation. It's our back to that whole top-down one insurance and company strategy where we're going to build a digital experience to enable claims, to enable the process as we go forward. Um, there's need for real time, 365, 24, 365 through various channels. That's only going to increase as, as we go forward. And we really need to uh, tackle the, you know, the, the barriers that we have to transformation. We need to think about modernization and really think about how we change insurance from batch to more real-time digital centric. The key thing is, is that we need to think about how do we evolve. Um, so Gardner talks about evolvability, you know, our ability to successfully adapt. And it's really about a cultural conversation that we need to think about. Um, not necessarily technology. It's about people process culture of how we want to think differently in a digital space uh, for insurance. Insurance is all alone in this, in this journey. Um, when you think about looking at other industries that have gone through transformational change, 
or even new industries that you are leading the conversation around AI, machine learning, real time, mobile, um, a lot of them have gone through transformations. If you look at Amazon, for example, they're only 20 years um, young or old, uh, but it took them 10 years to move to a new platform that allows them to have that personalized experience that you see today on Amazon.com. Even Airbnb, less than 10 years old, is now investing heavily to actually re-architect their platform because they've hit the limit of their scale, you know, the ability to scale and the ability to actually service new products and new clients and new ideas. And they're relatively new. And if you look at insurance, uh, a lot of the mainframes are 30, 40, 50 years old, and we haven't made an investment, but we, at the same time, we want to become more digital. So it's a, I think it's a thought process of around let's look out before we, and then look in and think and understand how we can sort of evolve that and adapt to the new uh, challenges that are coming coming forth. Um, last last piece is around how do you start to you know engage with the customers through your preferred channel? Um, we're enabling chatbots today, you know, through Google Home and Amazon Alexa. You have mobile devices uh, that you can interact with. You have the web, which is, is standard, but I think more folks are, are, are comfortable around the mobile devices. Key thing is, it's, it's all about data. You need to organize your data, um, whether it's real time or batch, but really think about how you want to drive your data conversation. How do you want to bring data together to have a unified client approach, um, unified client experience, unified client understanding, and then think differently about products. Um, they're not necessarily siloed. You know, how do you start to bring products together as a as an offering? So you're kind of looking at it from a, a different industry where you kind of have, you know, for, from telecom they have order management systems where you have groups of products and offers coming together to service your client. As we go forward, you know, omni-channel. So if whatever you start on the the web or mobile or call center, that should be a seamless experience across those channels. So you're able to drop off one channel and continue the conversation or the experience on another channel. We're back to you know, data science, machine learning, all drive personalization, all drive uh, microservices that will drive the experience on mobile and, and, and chatbot. So everything becomes very interconnected in the digital space and it's all predicated on, on data, thinking differently about how we transform our legacy systems to provide that real-time experience. Lots of opportunity is, is ahead of us in terms of how we can sort of increase the, the pace of change. Um, how can we start to build out flexible platforms to um, respond to the, today's demand, but what's tomorrow? And how do we ensure that we build flexible environments that we can respond to tomorrow, tomorrow's clients and business capabilities and, and pressures? Um, certainly do not want to repeat and build out another legacy environment to meet our digital demands today, but when the, the industry changes or the client demand changes, we need to re-architect and rebuild out. So a couple of things in close, uh, all about the digital transformation, re really rethinking about your legacy investments. It's all about data, standardizing your data to bring that unified client experience. And they all bundle together to support that kind of uh, improved client experience, whether it's through claims, onboarding, and other client journeys that you would have throughout your uh, uh, organization. Uh, Stephen? Thanks very much, Craig. You, it was an impressive uh, discussion. You touched uh, virtually all the bases. Uh, I was thinking as you were speaking, it might be helpful for uh, any of our attendees who don't know everything or anything about Sun Life, um, for those few who might not know the company. Can you just share a very high level uh, overview of the company's lines of business, kind of relative size and uh, markets for operations, things like that, just to give everybody context for the Q and A. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, Sun Life is a, is a global organization, uh, Sun Life Financial. Uh, we started uh, in Canada and grew through acquisitions over, over recent years. Uh, we in Canada we have uh, uh, wealth management, we do life insurance, uh, we have group retirement. Uh, group benefits. Um, we are one of the three largest uh, providers in, in Canada. 
we have a we're sixth largest provider in the U.S. and we have a substantial footprint in in I think six seven uh, regions within within Asia, which is uh, again another growing opportunity. Um, when you think differently, when you look at kind of globally, um, the markets are completely different in terms of how we um, think about data and digital in Canada versus if you look in Asia, it's, it's all mobile devices. Um, in the U.S., it's completely different in terms of how we service our clients and different product offerings that are unique to the U.S. versus Canada versus Asia. Um, so even that, you know, one company, very different um, cross region. Uh, but at the same time, looking to, you know, with the cloud uh, opportunity that we're building out is, uh, you know, how can we build solutions and capabilities once in Canada or the U.S. and Asia and actually leverage them in different regions? And I think, you know, as the cloud sort of supports that capability to sort of move capabilities throughout the globe, that will provide, I think, some opportunities that we haven't uh, really seen uh, without the cloud uh, being being deployed. Uh, thanks, Craig. That, that's really helpful. I think it gives, it certainly gives me and it probably gives everybody a much better sense of the sort of complexities and the challenges of uh, managing and directing enterprise data architecture. When you say siloed and you say data after that description, I think everybody gets a better understanding and perhaps offers, offers their uh, sympathies to you for the challenges. Um, but I thank you for that. And I want to point out to everybody on, on the line today that Craig, as well as Kusha, are both going to be presenting um, at the Connected Insurance Canada conference. You may not have heard a lot about that conference as yet because it is formally launching this week and the brochure will be sent out to everybody uh, who's on the mailing list and on this call today. Um, it is and will be the biggest event of its kind in Canada. Uh, it's expanded from prior years to, to encompass not only AI and analytics, but claims and Internet of Things and connected insurance. And I hope you all take a good look at the brochure and, uh, if possible, see if you can attend and clear your calendar for September 10th and 11th. With that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kusha uh, Golmohammadi and uh, share a little background again for context. Um, Kusha is Director of Advanced Analytics at Manulife John Hancock. He has over 10 years of experience in operational advanced analytics and in driving business value, leading to his current role at Manulife. He's responsible for advanced analytics projects in group benefits, as well as group retirement solutions at Manulife John Hancock, the Canada segment. Kusha has led many predictive and prescriptive analytics projects leveraging machine learning and statistical analysis in different roles as analytics leader and consultant for the government and for hedge funds prior to joining Manulife. Kusha has a PhD in computer science from the University of Alberta and an MSc and BSc in software engineering. Very impressive background. We look forward to hearing your comments, Kusha. Please go ahead. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so, uh, today I, I'd like to talk about three ideas and um, maybe discuss a little bit, um, uncover a little bit uh, detail and different angles in these uh, three ideas. Uh, first is uh, omni-channel uh, claim experience. Pretty much all insurers are trying to, uh, to implement this. Um, but the, the key idea here is, I think, focusing on mobile. Um, so people, they, they have a different expectation in industry, um, uh, using other products, using other services. They have uh, the same expectation, the same experience or similar experience that they are getting from other services um, in, in their entertainment, in their buying experience. They, they want that experience. Um, to have the same experience from their insurance companies. So that would be, for example, claim submission, claim status, uh, um, and really the, the idea here is to move from that one-way uh, communication uh, 
style or um, form to a two-way communication. Um, so some of the leading uh, teams in insurance companies in North America, they've already implemented mobile apps with different levels of success, uh, but majority of them, if not all, are one-way communication. They uh, send a notification to the user if they have the mobile application installed that your claim is uh, processed. It is less of a two-way communication. Secondly, uh, the data is not being captured and fed back to different uh, business units. So it seems that the efforts that are happening in omni-channel claim experience is centered and is focused within marketing groups in insurance companies. And there is a wealth of data, especially when uh, we are talking about mobile usage that could impact the product design because if we are looking at, uh, for example, how people are claiming, how they're using these services, how claims are being processed, where they are accessing the claims, what times they're logging in, um, this could inform the uh, design of products. Um, this could also inform pricing. The point is, first, having two-way uh, communication. Second, capturing this data, wealth of data, that in my view is a lot more than uh, the web channel. You have access to location. You also have a higher rate of um, uh, acceptance. When you send a notification through uh, the mobile application, there is a good chance that they look at that offer. The customer looks at that offer. They open that um, versus having this message in their, um, in their account and uh, looking at it after they log into their account or sending an email to them. The, the rate is under 20% when we engage with a customer um, through email. This is a lot higher when we engage with a customer through mobile application. And the wealth of data is, is a lot higher. We capture a lot more. It is also more secure when uh, we, we address a lot of issues uh, that might be related to account takeover risks uh, and so forth. So the key idea is two-way communication and uh, capturing data that goes beyond transactions, beyond looking at um, um, a claim status. And for every one of these topics uh, that, that I'm discussing, I, I will end with um, uh, one recommendation. And in this case, in the case of omnichannel claims experience, I think the recommendation is learning from the banks. Uh, the banks entered this uh, area a few years ahead of insurance companies. They have tried many different things. It is getting close to maturity in this, uh, in, in this uh, um, space. There are leading banks that have figured out the best way to communicate, have figured out tools to uh, have um, communication over mobile and through other channels, but my focus is, uh, is mobile. Um, and I think there is a lot to learn from the banks. The second idea is investing in uh, claim processing modernization. Again, this is not new. Pretty much all insurance companies, they want to uh, modernize their claim uh, systems. Um, a lot of these systems are legacy systems from 30, 40, 50 years ago. They're very good for um, processing transactions. You submit a claim, uh, $50, $60 for massage, uh, that system processes that, but they, are they were designed for operation not beyond that. It is extremely difficult to get data out of these mainframes, uh, out of these systems. They are designed with a narrow focus of adjudicating that, the claim that is being submitted, not with a broad focus of using this data for other purposes across the value chain. And um, I think the important thing here is uh, a cohesive strategy 
um, that is touching across the value chain. Um, and it is focused on customer. So insurance companies, they are already modernizing their claim systems. It, this modernization process um, has to be aligned and very well aligned with the broad global or enterprise level uh, data strategy, being data lake, being using cloud, being um, mashing up data, whatever that data strategy is, this modernization of claim has to be aligned with that because it is more than processing claims. It is more than adding Kafka that uh, feeds data to your uh, Hadoop. Um, it, this, there, this is the core competitive advantage that insurance companies uh, have, especially large insurers, um, to improve their services, to create value uh, for the uh, customers. Because looking at historical data, they can improve their service. They can change uh, products. If many people are submitting uh, massage claims, not so much uh, Cairo Physio, maybe there, there is an opportunity for adjusting uh, plan design for that particular sponsor or the, uh, that particular segment of uh, customers. And uh, the ending point for this item too is the focus has to be for, for value creation uh, and value delivery for customers. So value creation is, uh, is clear. Are we creating value? Are we creating uh, value, something that the, um, the customer wants? Value delivery is not really about delivering this uh, to the customer. Value delivery is they, they accept it. They think that this solves a real problem for them. And I think this will, uh, this will enable to prioritize different things that are going on in, in this space. Modernization um, of claims systems, legacy systems are typically projects that go beyond one or two years. And when, when you start the project in a large insurance company, the things that you want to do um, throughout uh, the timeline that you have the, in, in the project change, especially with fast pace of uh, technology, new vendors, new tools that are coming uh, into the market. The beaming light here, I think, is uh, value creation and value delivery for the customer. For each and every one of these items and deliverables, the question has to be, is this ad creating value for customers? And are we able to deliver this? Are, are, are they interested in this? The third idea is moving from responding to customers to um, anticipating customer needs. So instead of always being in that cycle of, okay, my, my customers uh, need, prefer to log in on a mobile device, so I have to create a mobile application. My customers want to see the total claim amount, so I have to add this uh, as a feature to the software. There is nothing wrong with that, uh, but uh, it is important to get ahead of this cycle and get to anticipating uh, customer needs. This fuels um, ideas in upsell, cross-sell. If, um, if you really be smart in this, I think it, it can directly hit the books uh, um, in that insurance uh, company. And uh, the ending idea here, I think, is using advanced analytics for this. Uh, advanced analytics has been proven time and again effective to improve services that we provide to customers being the end users of uh, that product or clients uh, being the sponsors or companies that buy these services from insurance companies. And this could impact, again, different uh, business units across the value chain in the insurance company. It is not only about serving um, claim uh, result or status 
to the client, it, it is well beyond that. It can improve, for example, the, the pricing of products. If you can anticipate the uh, withdrawal rate for uh, a sponsor, if you can anticipate how much claims, uh, how much claim um, a member or a segment of population is going to have next year, that could inform and change uh, the services that uh, you provide. And yeah, uh, just just to uh, summarize uh, for omni-channel experience, I think the key idea is learning from the banks for investing in uh, claim uh, processing and modernization. I think the key idea is focusing on value creation and value delivery for the customer and putting the customer at the center of all strategic and tactical uh, planning and for moving from responding to customer needs to anticipating customer needs. I think the key idea is uh, using advanced analytics at the center of that. Thanks very much, Kusha. Your your comments together with Craig's have uh, definitely resonated with the audience. We've got uh, a large number of terrific questions, and uh, and I think collectively you've done a, both done a great job of reflecting the uh, theme of today's webinar as well as uh, the Connected Insurance Canada conference theme. Um, before I move on to Q and A, um, Kusha, please I should should have done this at the front end uh, when I introduced you. But can you do the same for us that Craig did and just give us a sense of Manulife's uh, operations, lines of business, areas of, oper of market operation, et cetera, just a high-level overview? Sure. Uh, Manulife is the largest insurance company in Canada. It started in Canada over 100 years ago, uh, operates in Canada, United States, and Asia, primarily in uh, China. Um, and um, market cap of um, manual life about, I think today is about uh, 53 billion revenue, uh, 50 billion uh, a year, 35,000 employees in Canada. We have about 7,000 employees. The lines of businesses in, Canada, in uh, manual life, we have uh, health insurance, we have group retirement uh, solution, and we have our wealth asset management uh, that has about a trillion dollars, uh, a little shy of a trillion dollars uh, assets under management. Um, there are other services um, at Manulife, um, smaller business of uh, the bank, and um, also retail um, insurance through travel insurance, affinity, and that sort of thing. Thanks very much. That translates to an awful lot of data and a large, a very large number of customers to serve. So I think that really puts it, everything in context. Um, I'm going to get right into the q and I'm sure we're going to uh, have a, a, lot, a lot of uh, back and forth on this. So our first question, oh, by the way, uh, somebody did ask, a few people asked about the welcome screen. Were there any slides for today's presentation? There were not. They were all just verbal comments. And the welcome screen is the only slide you should see, so don't don't be worried about that. Um, that said, I'm going to move into our first question, um, and I'll ask Craig to, to go first and Kusha second. Any suggestions on how to approach resistance from claims teams who have been, quote, doing it this way for years, and it works, so why fix something that ain't broke? And you're welcome to broaden your response beyond just claims teams to any of the enterprise verticals. So how do you approach yeah. resistance? How do you manage it, Craig? Yeah, great great question. And I, it, it sort of comes back to it's, it's, it's rarely about the technology and, and more about people process and, and change. Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of manage that uh, cultural change um, within any capability that you're, you're, you're planning to uh, to digitize or, or, or transform uh, early days in some of that and some of those conversations here um, it, it's really painting a, a roadmap a vision in terms of uh, what the client expects and then you know playing it back to to key executives and, and having them sort of buy into that 
And, and that sort of comes down to the top-down approach of where here, here's the here's here's the approach, here's where we're going, and here's the benefit. In a lot of, in a lot of cases, you know, the use of AI and others, a lot of fear of you know job loss or you know jobs will change. Um, but it, it really comes down to you know how do we manage that change? How do we manage uh, you know provide that sort of future roadmap and and provide comfort that employment's still going to be there? But your job or you know job is going to change. But it at the end of the day it's 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 about uh, it's about client experience and we need to be able to prove you know provide improved client experiences because you know the Googles and Amazon are they're setting the standard for experiences on on the web and mobile and through those bots and uh, a lot of the processes that we do have today are you know decades old they do work absolutely but they, they work in a real-time digital environment. So it's really, you know, providing that roadmap, um, top-down leadership, and, and supporting that, you know, change management conversation with those groups that are, you know, impacted by the transformation. Thanks, Craig. Kusha, uh, would you like to add anything to that? I, I think uh, Craig did a, a great job, but uh, what I would like to do is maybe uh, make a seemingly outrageous claim that it is actually broken. Uh, the argument that it is not broken, why fix it? I'd like to argue that it is broken, and the market tells you it is broken, because when uh, you, uh, your insurance company, when we, we think about claim adjudication, um, there are different levels um, in insurance companies, but about um, 70 to 80 percent around that are adjudicated automatically. A large portion of that, 20, 30 percent, is adjudicated manually. This this cannot continue because the the margins uh, do not allow for that. Your competitors are lowering their costs in, for example. Uh, claim adjudication, and you cannot leave this, uh, continue doing it the way you're doing it. Like uh, the the cost of uh, processing this manually is too high. Now you can take the same analogy and extend it to other areas, other business units that are associated with uh, claims. Think about uh, your your marketing. If you're not able to create value out of claims data, you are limited, and you, that limits your your uh, competitive advantage. You will lose that competitive advantage because your competitors are creating value through that. They're using that data to optimize their services. They're using that data to upsell, to cross-sell to their members. So the market tells you, I think, uh, that uh, that uh, it's broken, actually. Thanks very much. And for what it's worth, I totally agree with you. And, and I think a l large number of our colleagues on the call do too. Um, next question. Can Craig speak of successes or challenges implementing RPA at Sun Life? And of course, Kusha, I'll ask you to do the same after Craig. Yeah, our RPA is uh, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting journey. Uh, very much more of a end user computing uh, paradigm that uh, we we took upon uh, here at uh, within Sun Life. Uh, still working through um, a lot of the, the challenges uh, of RPA, but the uh, you know some of the initial pilots uh, that the business has run has have proved you know successful in in terms of just moving that forward. Uh, much more work to be done. Um, I think you know if we look back you know look forward 12 months, I think we'll be certainly in a different position. But you know, it's kind of looking at RPA. How do you sort of tie that together with you know your AI journey? How do you tie that into you know your chatbots? And and how do you look at you know when you're selecting opportunities for RPA? You know, what are the the real manual tasks that uh, you know business users are completing? Say in the call center, um, you know, are they flipping screens? Are they having to rekey in, in data into different systems? Um, those are some of the opportunities you may want to look at in terms of you know to create you know, using RPA to create those efficiencies um, but it's it, at the you know it's really a end user computing kind of mindset 
because they they know the business, they understand the process flows, they're able to um, you know quickly um, you know agile um, shift shift gears in terms of what's priority and what's not um, in that uh, enablement. So 12 months from now, I think we'll have a, I'll have a better picture for you. But uh, right now, that's kind of the high level state of, of where we're at. Thanks, Craig. If I may, I don't know if you can answer the question, but as a follow up before Kusha responds, um, w when somebody says RPA to you, um, what comes to your mind within your organization as sort of the lowest hanging fruit, if I can use that expression, or the best use case? where you've pursued or are pursuing RPA, if you can share that. Yeah, it's just the, uh, it's the, the rekeying of, of data across uh, multiple legacy, uh, you know, mainframe screens. How can we sort of, you know, automate that process so we key once and it kind of, you know, pre-fills across other other systems. It, that, that's really the, the value. And if you look at um, time on the call when the client's on, on, uh, on the call with the agent, you know, how do we start to optimize that? Um, that process and uh, you know RPA, although it doesn't you know provide that uh, you know legacy transformation, um, it does you know create efficiencies to to handle that call um, you know within a certain you know improved time frame and, and provide uh, the client an improved experience over. Uh, uh, can I can you put put you on hold while I flip through screens and that? So it's that's kind of the, I think the, the you know the, the sweet spot at the moment. Thank you. You make it sound so easy to do, uh, so easy to say, and we imagine it's so hard to do. Um, Kusha, you're, in Manulife, with your experience, uh, or broadly, RPA challenges, best use cases, uh, early opportunities, what do you see? Um, I, I don't think I can respond to this because I'm not very close to our RPA efforts, and um, I know that this experience is uh, very different, for example, in LTD, long-term disability, short-term disability business that we have versus, for example, uh, affinity or underwriting. Um, um, so I'm happy to take this back and uh, ask our leaders uh, about their primary challenges, but I'm not uh, close to this. Um, I can tell you that the experience is very different from one business to another business. Very good. Perhaps we can pursue the question um, at the um, Connected Insurance Canada conference. That was good, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have another question waiting here, and then I'll have a follow-on to this of my own that it sort of leads to. But the uh, audience question is, who polices the AI to confirm that it's working appropriately and accurately and meeting the customer's needs? Uh, Craig? If you would, yeah, great, great question. And uh, our, our risk management team asked the same question, and we kind of all looked at one another around the, you know, the need for for governance around that. Um, how do we, uh, you know, so new, um, you know, there's some, uh, you know, commercial uh, AI products that are kind of black box. How do you have that trust that they're providing the the right insight or output? Um, and internally, how do we sort of benchmark that um, as, you know, A, B kind of testing around that? Uh, yeah, so some work is, is being kicked off around that in terms of, you know, is it, you know, ethics and, and how do we ensure that, you know, biases aren't embedded within the uh, AI or the algorithms that we build out? So I, I think more to come on that early days, but it's certainly at the top of mind of, of the top of the house of, you know, as we go down this journey that there's, it's just not about tech. It's just not about the algorithms. There's a, a human side around this that we need to consider and ensure that we have the, ensure the right decisions are made uh, with the right criteria um, as we go forward. Thanks, Craig. You, you actually touched upon my follow-up question around ethics, but I'll come back around to that. Uh, but first I'll ask Kusha to respond to who polices the AI uh, to, a, to confirm that it's working appropriately and meeting customer needs. Um, it's a tough one. Um, we wrestle with this question every quarter when we meet um, or we prepare to meet with uh, our chief analytics officer and uh, um, executive leaders. And, um, 
it, I think the important, so is there a process, uh, a cohesive uh, policing one, two, three, five process? Um, not so much. Uh, are we monitoring the models? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think the, the point here is uh, to be uh, mindful and agile based on the use case. If we are uh, showing, for example, an estimate about um, the claim experience to a customer, and that's one thing. If we are prescribing something, that's a different story. If we are doing pricing on something, that's a different story. So based on the risk level of these applications, I think they should get a different treatment. And some of these projects where we have um, um, very high risk items, uh, we are making predictions about, uh, for example, um, assets. Uh, we are making predictions on pricing. Uh, they are, um, there are very precise um, uh, probing, uh, going to the root of every step of the project. And for projects that we are not really doing, like the risk is lower, for example, uh, propensity of uh, individuals. If that prediction is off by a few percentage points, um, maybe it's not, uh, it's not a huge risk uh, for the corporation, it's not a huge risk for sponsors, and it is not a huge risk for our customers. Um, so our, our process, our policing, uh, as called, is, is very different and based on uh, projects, and it is based on the risk for the project. Typically, it is a collaborative effort between the uh, advanced analytics team and the, uh, the business. In the cases that the risk is too high, uh, there is compliance, of course, involved. Anything that we send to uh, customers, compliance and legal is involved. And uh, anything that is uh, related to pricing, um, or uh, calculating risks, for example, underwriting, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes, um, aside from the business, the uh, risk analysis uh, or the risk team within that business or outside that business is involved, either in the form of peer reviewing the, the full project or approving the project. Thanks for that. Let me ask the follow-up question. I know it's probably a very big and broad question, but looking for maybe some concise high-level answers to the topic of ethics in insurance and AI. Um, it's starting to appear in articles and in discussions uh, around the conference uh, segment of the industry and, and other, other parts of the business. And I'm just wondering what each of you think of in terms of uh, the first areas of operation and the first uh, focuses of, uh, of intellectual property on the subject of ethics and AI and insurance. I don't know if it's a fair question, but it sounds like an interesting one. So Craig, I'll ask you first. Yeah, uh, great, great question. Uh, haven't really, uh, it's it's on the on the list to it's on the to do list perhaps. Uh, there's more of a business conversation than an architectural one, so I I'll have to defer <laughs> defer uh, any any commentary. That's a fair comment. It actually is a telling comment. Thank you. Well, what about you, Kusha? Do you have anything to offer there yet? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, some uh, broad uh, guidelines. There are fields that uh, we cannot use, uh, for example, the ethnicity and uh, some, um, some of the fields. Um, we have this data, but uh, the compliance and the guideline that we have does not allow using this data. There is additional um, um, compliance that is involved, uh, which is imposed by the sponsor and the contractual agreement. So some sponsors would not agree, for example, uh, using some information or contacting their members for uh, some projects. Some sponsors will not allow, and this is actually a typical uh, one, um, 
having a distinction between our group benefit uh, products and group retirement solutions, especially when there is marketing involved, um, uh, looking at um, the broader guidelines that we have and also contractual agreements uh, that we have. We, we do that actually across our projects. There is a team that uh, checks for these things. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I've got my eye on the clock. Um, it's amazing how quickly the session always goes with all the questions, and we have a lot more. So just before I ask the final question, that I think we can fit it in. Just a reminder to everybody to look for the announcement and the brochure for Connected Insurance Canada, September 10th and 11th in Toronto. Uh, we're expecting over 350 senior level and executive level attendees. We will have over 60 speakers. There are actually three events being folded into one on AI, on claims and IoT, and 20 practical case studies. So uh, that's some explanation of why we say it's the biggest conference to ever be held on this topic in Canada. Uh, and with that, our last question I think we have time for is, where do you see NLP, which is natural language processing, where do you see NLP going to transform all the manual process currently employed? That is high volume, low value tasks. I just want to find the end of the question here. That currently require thousands of annual work hours. Uh, any, any response on where how NLP will affect that part of the business or any other? Craig. Yeah, I think there's a couple of pieces is that, uh, you know, when it comes down to chatbots, that, you know, natural language processing uh, plays key within that. Um, or when, you know, you're calling through the, uh, you know, the call center, IVR, um, large opportunity in that space. Um, what we're also looking at is, you know, the whole, all the, all the, paper-based uh, documentation that's being digitized, you know, how to, how to start to pick off those, uh, you know, handwriting and uh, preformed text and how to, you know, gain insights out of that, um, that just not possible um, previously. Um, so looking at some opportunities, uh, you know, with our cloud partners and, and other partners around that to help uh, to enable that. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think early, Early days, but a great opportunity um, just to change uh, just with the volume of, of data that's out there unstructured and, and how to put structure around um, leveraging uh, NLP to help support that. Thanks, Craig. Kusha, NLP in manual life? Uh, this is a good one. Uh, we have had uh, projects on this, uh, I think, since 2017. Um, and uh, the projects uh, span uh, have a very large span. Uh, the approach is very similar, um, but the uh, projects are uh, uh, the business units that uh, we target are uh, very different uh, from a call center that uh, Craig mentioned to optimize a call center to identify why people are calling, what are the topic, like doing topic modeling, what are the topics that uh, are getting a lot of calls, um, identifying calls uh, that are taking too long, all the way to textual data and claims that they submit, uh, how we can uh, capture that and uh, process that at large scale. Like we receive millions of claims uh, monthly, how we can extract some information and create value for our customers. Um, it is also dependent to our infrastructure and cloud uh, and capabilities that we have. Um, I think we, we have made a good progress um, at Manulife uh, in this area and uh, the, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, more value is generated from this. This is a very exciting area for us. Thanks, Kusha. Um, time is almost up, so I need to thank very much Craig Milroy and Kusha Goma Hamadi for their insight today and their comments. Uh, again, you'll get a chance to hear them uh, speak on these topics at Connected Insurance Canada in Toronto on September 10th and 11th. And we look forward to seeing all of you and those of you who are attending 
next week, the AI and Analytics Conference here in Chicago on Thursday and Friday. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. Have a wonderful day, and thanks again.